All right, so welcome everybody. Tonight, we it's day eight of the 14 day blood sugar challenge. So you've been here over a week. Week one was all about body awareness. Now week two, we're learning about um, how our body responds and how we can hack our blood sugar and also the things that impact our blood sugar. So I'm super happy to have with me tonight, so Trina Sutherland. So Trina is a pharmacist from Miramichi, New Brunswick. She is the owner of the Medicine Shop Pharmacy in Miramichi. And um, I'm gonna let Trina just kind of open by sharing her experience. Um, oh, maybe we lost her. Let's see if we get her back. <laughs> when she comes back, hopefully she'll start talking. Let's see if I can put her. There she is. Are you back, Trina? <laughs> there she comes. Here we go. Sorry, I got kicked out somehow. No problem. Okay. Oh, and let's and let's me get your video on as well. Oh, is it? There. Oh, there we go. There Copy? you are. Perfect. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. All right. I can't see myself, but maybe I will soon. Okay. Can you see the screen? <laughs> I, just don't know if you can, I can see the screen. I just hope you can see me if you're trying to. Yes, we can. I think it's because we okay. had I had you on blocked. So oh, okay, I was good. saying how that you are a pharmacist for Miramichi, New Brunswick, and that um, you're going to begin by sharing a little bit about your experience with the Freestyle Libra and um, the experiences that you've seen of patients coming in, you know, how they've applied it and the changes that they've seen. And then you and I are going to go into a conversation about hormones and blood sugar. Okay, sure. We can do that. So, um, I guess, there we go. There you go. See me now. <laughs> so, yeah, so I started, uh, I've done a 14 day Libra challenge in the past. This is my kind of second time doing one of these challenges with uh, the blood glucose monitor monitoring and seeing what, what's good, bad, the ugly, whatever we want to say. Um, the both times that I've done it, I found that it's been interesting for me. Um, uh, Dr. Keenan and I've had a couple of discussions about my numbers, particularly the over the last week, because uh, I'm, I'm one of these people that just can't get a spike. <laughs> I tend to run low and, um, and uh, don't often see a number over six. And that was consistent for me with my previous 14 days that I had done before as well. So it's interesting when you're in that situation, you're somebody that does eat. I, I'm not personally doing a ketosis diet per se, but I have in the past but I am trying to eat lower carb for sure. And I'm just somebody that I like to say has sticky weight. It likes to get on me and stick around. And I've had success in the past, but in the last three years, since uh, the beginning of this wonderful realm of the new world of COVID, uh, of course had a little weight gain, a little more than a little. And uh, it's been an extra challenge to try to get those pounds to go away. So. For me, I wanted to try the, the challenge again, along with having Dr. Keenan involved to kind of have somebody else's set of eyes on the numbers, not just my own, see what she thought might be the situation. And so the two of us have had some conversations. And, and so for me personally, that's been my experience and uh, we're having, having some fun with it and, uh, and trying to see where it co comes and goes from there. Um, insofar as having patients that are on the uh, Libre, for the most part, my patients that are on it are, have been diagnosed diabetic. And um, a lot of times we encourage and utilize the system uh, to really, really help folks um, know what's going on. And People just have so much better control over their blood sugar by utilizing the uh, the uh, the Libra system because you just don't have to worry. It's that finger pick is gone and all that stuff, which obviously we know what's going on if we're all wearing one. So it makes such a big difference. Really helps our our patients uh, manage those those health issues so much easier and 
I'm a big advocate and uh, try to encourage folks to uh, make the switch, just even if it is for a trial. And then oftentimes once, once we give it a go, they can't believe the difference it makes for them in the knowledge. It's the knowledge of, of what's going on in their lives. And knowledge is power and it allows us to help people make better decisions from there. Wonderfully said, Trina. Thank you. Knowledge is power. That's it. And when you know, you can't go back, right? Like once you know that this is the impact, when you see that number, it can make huge changes in the mindset uh, of the way that we, what, what we eat. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's Trina's introduction, which is wonderful. And her share, share like, so Trina has a clinic in Miramichi, you know, it's the town where I'm from, about 20,000 people. Um, but, you know, Trina and I are also, we're kind of, you know, we're, we're women of middle age-ish. <laughs> okay. So, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we also know the impact of hormones. And that's why I thought we'd delve into that a little bit. Because there's so much I think that you need to be aware of because so many women go into this time and I have many patients now, they're wondering why, okay, I just turned 50, I eat the same foods, but I'm gaining weight. My muscle tone is not good, kind of what's going on here. So I wanted to back this up. I wanna show you just a few slides and, and Trina and I'll kind of, it'll start a little conversation with us. So I'm gonna share the screen here and here we go. There we go. All right. Can you see that, Trina? Yep. Yes. Okay. So that's your intro. So I pulled this one up first. So this is from Diabetes UK. This is Diabetes England. And this is a great talking point. So this is type 1 diabetes and managing the menopause with HRT. This is Dawn's story. So we don't talk about this, right? It's not discussed. Um, women in terms of research, just to let you know, we are kind of at the bottom end of the spectrum when it comes to a lot of our hormonal management. But I wanted to put this slide up uh, with Dawn because she says, with HRT, my blood sugar levels have been more stable. There isn't that fluctuation. And she goes on to read a little bit about in the article how she was having such difficulty. Of course, she was also having hot flashes and irritability, but it was really her blood sugar. And after just a few months, on hormone replacement, she was able to get them stabilized even more. And she talks about how often women with diabetes type one were scared about hormones, but we really need to open the conversation for women that have you know, diabetes type one or even type two. So what do you think, Trina? Have you seen um, this you know, with a lot of you know, the insulin dependent diabetics that come in? Well, to be honest, I'll have to just be honest. I haven't had a lot of insulin dependent diabetics come in to talk to me about um, uh, issues relating to menopause type symptoms, I'll say. Um, it hasn't been something that's occurred on a regular basis. Now that being said, to kind of uh, make a segue into um, something that's kind of similar, oftentimes when I am consulting with ladies, and discuss uh, consulting with regards to uh, menopause type symptoms. Oftentimes, one of the questions I ask is, do you feel or that you may have any sort of uncontrolled blood sugar issues? And sometimes the person recognizes that they do within themselves and sometimes they don't. And we've done some, you know, I haven't gone so far as offering a, a doing a, a, a freestyle Libra, but I have done some, uh, um, you know, finger pick testing just uh, to see, you know, where are you at right now? Let's do a couple more tests over a few more days to see, are your sugars within levels that are, you know, on a one-off even type of thing to see how you're doing. And if we notice any sort of trending, I'll say, let's, you know, do a little bit longer of a test here and let's get some an A1C ordered or, uh, and see where we're at with that. And, and sometimes we do find a correlation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it brings up the fact that are women asking, you know, because so many times, especially type one, um, you know, and even menopause in general, often, 
you know, women, you're sometimes you're hiding away and you're afraid to ask, but you're afraid what your doctor might do. You know, it's very, it's not as common that, you know, Trina is a pharmacist, but she's done additional training in hormonal management. So I think it's part of that conversation. So let's look at this next one. Okay. So this is from the endocrinology web. Okay. And this was just released in January of this year. So women with menopause are significantly higher risk of developing um, NFALD, which is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The increase can be nearly 2.4 times post-menopause. So we know that fatty liver disease is rampant. They say anywhere from 10 to 25%, but we're seeing this go up even more in that post-menopausal period. So do you have women or people that come in in general, Trina, does anyone talk to you about fatty liver disease? I haven't had that conversation, although this doesn't surprise me in any way due to the fact that we see the women in menopause with that, that like you had mentioned right at the cuff here about, you know, gaining weight or getting like the belly fat and things like that. And not because of, of in, any sort of increased or excess of alcohol use. And so this is something that makes a whole lot of sense, you know? Because, you know, I've had many people coming in while I was doing this research, you know, a few women were coming in, they have maybe abdominal pain. Um, and so, or maybe their liver function test is up a little bit, and then I'll do an ultrasound, and we're getting this fatty liver disease. And they're really surprised because, again, they're not drinkers, but sometimes it can be the hormone changes. So let's look at this study, okay? So I just want to highlight this one because, I, and I brought these articles up just so that you know that this information is out there, it's just not being presented. So I lost my little arrows, but so the interplay between metabolic dysregulation, so that means sugar imbalance, okay, and non, and this fatty liver disease in women after menopause. But what's really interesting when they talk about it, so what is going on here? So it's suggested, if I move my, can't move my arrow, but here is where they comment, and this just came out in June of 2021. So this is quite recent and we're really, the research on women and menopause and sugar is really just starting to expand. But here they're talking about what's going on because so more than half of postmenopausal women with diabetes type two have fatty liver disease. So, and I see this all the time. So liver tests might be up a little bit, but when you get to diabetes type two, that means your A1C is above 6.5%. That fat that's surrounding your liver, that's part of the issue that's causing that diabetes to happen. So what's going on? So it's suggested that estrogens, because you know after menopause, we lose our estrogen, we lose our progesterone, and we lose testosterone. So it's suggested that estrogens slow the progression of chronic liver disease by suppressing inflammation. They improve our mitochondria, which are those little battery packs in our cells. They alleviate oxidative stress. So that's inflammation, okay? They um, improve insulin re resistance and they improve fibrogenesis. So that's the um, when the fatty liver gets fatty. So that's fibrins being laid down in the liver, okay? And then they also talk that some women, of course, if you went into menopause and you already have PCOS, and there's a lot of women, I think it's one in 10 women can have PCOS, that you're going to be even at a higher risk of getting fatty liver disease when you go after menopause. So then the article talks here about lifestyle interventions. We know it, physical activity and dietary advice. But what I liked at the end, um, and I think it kind of, oh, I think it came off my screen, but the, it talks about, it is necessary to investigate the potential effects of estradiol progesterone and some of these other drugs on fatty liver disease. And so this is what the article goes on to talk about. Because when we look at the research perspective, we don't have it there so much in terms of knowing what's going to, to aid this or to start to improve it or to change it. So Trina, I guess one of the things because what am I going to go, um, just to talk a little bit about this, like, so in the article, you know, they're talking about estrogen, they're talking about progesterone. So let's just kind of get into that just a little bit more. 
of what's kind of happening with the menopause and why women are having so many of these symptoms. So let's tackle, because we know they both go down, right? And, you know, from what we see is that, you know, progesterone starts to drop first and then the estrogen, estrogen goes, estrogen is the roller coaster of menopause and then it starts to bottom out too, especially after you've gone through. So um, just talk about that, where you see more of the estrogen-based symptoms and the progesterone-based symptoms. Right. So now, I mean, um, in my understanding and what I tend to tend to note with um, a lot of women when I'm going through um, symptom uh, assessment of what's happening, um, I'll ask a lot of kind of groups of questions and within certain groupings of, of the questions, um, I'll go like a progesterone based, usually in my experience, progesterone based uh, groups of uh, symptoms are uh, sleep disturbances, hot flashes, night sweats, they can lean into the estrogen too, but a lot of times we can do a lot of work with progesterone with those guys. Um, those three are my big three that I tend to notice uh, if we can nail out the progesterone and as well if they haven't quite uh, finish the period uh, cycling yet. If they're having irregular periods, we can make some managements with that as well. So that's always a nice thing to regulate uh, people again with with the progesterone and helps that. Um, when so let's, I go, let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Let's just kind of stay mm -hmm. on progesterone for a little bit. Sure. So, you know, women need to know this, right? Like sleep, mm -hmm. it's number one. If you don't sleep, <laughs> you don't repair yourself you don't get rejuvenated, it will add to your insulin resistance, right? And so many women, they, they think, oh, it's just, I'm not a good sleeper, you know, but some of them began to recognize, I used to sleep well, but it's that middle of the night waking up, eh, Trina, like they just can't yeah. get through the whole night's rest. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. So that, that dysregulation that starts to happen and it's that, you know, imbalance between your, your progesterone. And then of course that lends itself to your cortisol, uh, imbalances because it's pulling cortisol pulling from if there's not enough or too much it pulls from your sex hormones that gets that's the chemical pathway in the body that tends to be easiest to steal from because uh, we can't live without cortisol but we can live without progesterone and estrogen so the body will steal where it's needed most and then we get dysregulation so I love that so you know, and women, so we're talking about cortisol, the stress hormone. It's true. It's, it's a hormone that we need, you know, and the body's going to make it priority. And that's why if you go into menopause, or for some of us that have been there, if you're going through more stressful events, you'll notice your hot flashes often can get worse, right? Because everything starts getting impacted by that. Um, but the other thing, Trina, I notice a lot with menopause in terms of the progesterone, and I really um, explored this when I was doing work in cannabis, when I was doing my research and I used to prescribe cannabis in Canada for, for, for women and men, but is the muscle aches and pains that come. And a lot of women don't realize that that is also related to their hormones. You know, the, the joint aches and pains, they're feeling just achy, sore all over. Um, have you seen that a lot as well? Yeah, absolutely. Both, both. Uh, I have, I, I've noticed uh, it's a question uh, in my symptom assessment assessments that I always ask. And um, I'd say most people have some version of muscle ache, joint issues um, that's happening to the scale of where they put themselves is always different across the board but it's almost without fail that everybody has at least, you know, one or two out of 10 of, of discomfort uh, at, at the bottom end and it progresses from there. And then the other you mentioned is a heavy bleeding, right? Mm, and I know yeah. this talk is about sugar, but we just have to talk about some of these hormones because as progesterone drops, you see the women coming in, you know, with flooding and just kind of all over their, their cycles that they're bleeding. Yeah, yeah. So that's progesterone, some of the main things that we begin to see. Okay, so what about your estrogen, <laughs> our estrogen? So, yeah, for sure. So the estradiol, of course, is the main estrogen that we're always talking about when we say estrogen, but there's a couple other estrogens that are super important to the body, but those are just details. We can, if somebody was more interested in that in the, in the future, we can have that, that deeper discussion. But 
in the in when it comes to talking about what estrogens uh, mean to you in your symptom assessment assessment, I always I always main pocket is I call them the emotional imbalances. So the mood swings, the um, anxiety, the nervousness, the depressions, um, the feeling uh, tired but wired, uh, feeling. Um, uh, let me think here. There was uh, overwhelmed, even you know, um, brain all fog, of those maybe. brain fog brain is fog. another huge, huge estrogen, like I call it cotton brain or or things like that. And then the other big one that estrogen and it gets often overlooked because um, people uh, we think when we think sex drive, a lot of times people go to the male hormone testosterone, which is also in females, of course at a lower dose, we don't need it as much, but oftentimes we think, oh, it must be testosterone, we need to improve. And I always call it, my joke is we need to fix brains before birds, meaning we fix the brain with some estrogen to get the brain wanting the sex drive and the testosterone increase helps with that libido, uh, the response, I'll say, to the the sexual activity. So. Those are, that's always my, my thing, brains before birds. So get that estrogen working, get that brain going again in that regard. And it's just amazing, right? The mental clarity that women have after they've, you know, been on hormone replacement. Like, you know, so many of my patients are like, I haven't felt this good in five years. Like, mm. Mm. yeah. One lady's husband brought me flowers because things got so much better at their life. <laughs> And so, so on both of those hormones, so too, the other thing that we start to see is, so it, just like we were mentioning in the slides, is we can begin then to see that impact on the insulin resistance and the insulin regulation. I had a patient I was working with, Trina, and you know, she was, she was slim, but she developed prediabetes. And we looked at her numbers, we did the Freestyle Libra, and she was having lots of, of peaks. And so she's like, you know, hacking her diet as much as she can do it. But also at the same time, she was having hormonal changes. And um, after, so the first three months, nothing was shifting. We put her on the hormone replacement, estrogen and progesterone. Her numbers came right down. She was feeling amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. So I think we do need to add that to the conversation with women, which is why for those that are listening in, it's a conversation to have about your hormones and how they may be impacting your blood sugar. Um, the other one, just to, to talk about from an estrogen progesterone standpoint, is the kind of the big part of the picture too is osteoporosis. And I yeah. think maybe that's the one we can add because I know for me, you know, as when women come in and maybe they're on the fence, I'll say, let's get a bone density. Let's see where mm -hmm. your bones are. Because if you're 50 and you're already osteopenic, or I've been surprised, I've had osteoporotic women at wow. 50, right? And then you weigh the pros and cons. It's like, okay, do you want to go on a drug for osteoporosis or do you want to go on estrogen and progesterone that are going to give you all these other amazing benefits? Yeah. And maybe fix a little bit of the problem a little bit better too, you know? Yes. And when we look at the, the development, so I've, I have in my office like a few slides that I show my patients because you can see the bone density improvements when they've done research, you know, <clears throat> by putting you back on hormone replacement therapy. And especially too for Trina, uh, Trina is those women that go through premature menopause. You know, any woman, if she's gone into menopause at 40, those women really are at risk. High risk. Yeah. Yeah. If they've hit for any reason, whether it's been a surgically induced menopause or a natural pre like early menopause, whatever the reason their their risk, I mean, we're we're just dialing that clock backwards on them, unfortunately, you know. And I find those women too, their estrogen dose goes up a little bit more than my typical postmenopausal woman when they're like say 42 in early men, you know, premature menopause. Yeah, they need a little more. Yeah. So then the other hormone we'll talk about, let's talk a little bit about testosterone then. Sure. So testosterone, again, we know. So the big question when you go into menopause is number one, women gain weight. And so which part of it, you know, is happening? Because we know as the hormones come down, you can start to have a higher fat mass. But when we start adding a little testosterone into that, we know that it can help 
with that muscle regulation and muscle tone. And you've got quite a few women as well, Trina, right? Taking uh, testosterone supplementation. Yeah, I, there's very few people that I have on um, a version of HRT that doesn't, like I'd say 80% have some testosterone on board as well. And it's great. And if you look at the guidelines, you know, and women are, you know, part of this discussion is women are so often afraid, right? But if you look at even the latest um, North American Menopause Society guidelines, no one can find much bad to say about testosterone. No, no, really not. And yeah, like depending on uh, where you live and what what accessibility you have to different things, um, testosterone can be made in really super low doses very easily and in different formats. So, you know, I have a lot of ladies when I mention testosterone, they, they're like, well, I'm already growing extra hair. I don't want to grow a bigger beard, you know? And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, we're not, we're not dosing you like a man here. We're, we're supplementing you with a super, you know, low concentration, exactly what your body should naturally need. And I guess we should say, so Trina is what's called a compounding pharmacist. So here in Bermuda, we have a few compounding pharmacists as well. And can you say, Trina, how you kind of mix, mix up these compounds and maybe just talk about how that they are bioidentical? Yeah, sure. So there's um, basically when you compound a product, uh, oftentimes with, um, uh, with hormones, we utilize one of, there's usually two main formats we go with, either a cream that you rub in to uh, a little bit of a small area of a fatty tissue uh, or subcutaneous fatty tissue in the arm usually, um, or we do what's called a lozenge or, or a troche, which you can allow to melt under the tongue. And the reason we use these formats is to bypass what's called the first pass effect, which is we're bypassing the, um, uh, the liver needing to process the drugs and uh, the stomach isn't breaking them down at all, I should say. The liver is then, uh, doesn't have to work as hard basically to get the, the drug to the active amount needed, which allows us in theory to use a lower dose of the hormones to treat you and get the desired out, outcome. And that's the whole goal with hormone replacement therapy is utilizing the lowest dose for the lowest amount of time to help your symptoms. So we kind of get an extra win when we do it that way. Um, so that being said, we, we purchase uh, the raw powders, uh, whether it be uh, a progesterone, a estradiol, or a testosterone. Um, and by purchase, purchasing them as a raw ingredient, we're purchasing them in a format that is what the body recognizes immediately. So it's not needing to do any sort of transformation to this product once it gets into the body in order for the body to recognize it. So yet again, allowing us to utilize the lowest dose possible for it to be effective for your body. From that, we mix it with the bare minimum number of uh, pre uh, preservatives or um, stabilizer. And then we put it in either an appropriate, uh, you know, low opportunity for allergenic uh, events type cream or base or into a, uh, a gel, jelly gummy, I should say, or waxy type base to be a, a lozenge that would be absorbed under the tongue. So those are generally the, the benefits of a, of a compounded version of a, of a HRT type product. Thanks, Trina. And then, and we also have as well, we have, you know, over the counter, or sorry, prescription now we can buy Estra, yep. estra gel, which is estradiol, which is, you know, body identical and also progesterone, which goes by the names Prometrium or in Bermuda, we have a Eutrogestin, which is a, a, um, a British brand. And those again are the same. Sometimes, you know, depending on you, your conditions and what's happening, and this is why you do need informed discussion, because sometimes we will choose to take progesterone by mouth, other times we choose yeah. it by cream or topical. Um, but yeah. Just so that you know that there are many options for women and uh, maybe women may have a few questions after.
Absolutely. Yeah. And the, I do like, and I'm not just like promoting only compounded stuff. There's a couple of products that are commercially made that I'm a fan of. Like you mentioned, the micronized progesterone uh, capsules, the Prometrium, they're an amazing product. And uh, sometimes the by mouth option is good because the body does um, get it out of the system faster than per, uh, having a, a pocket that's been sitting in the arm or whatever. Uh, it can take like up to a week or two for the body to rid itself of all of that progesterone in a cream format versus a tablet or a capsule format. It's usually cleared within a 24 hour period. So if you're really wanting to get that dose out of the body quicker, for some reason, there's good benefit or value or reasons to choose what you choose. And that's why we, it's good to have those discussions. Yeah. So there's, again, so much we could talk about on hormone yeah. replacement, but let's, <laughs> So just a few more things we'll get into, and then people may have some questions, because I knew this would happen, because Trina and I, we both love to talk, if you can't tell. Um, I'm going to share the screen just for a few more slides, Trina, and then we're going to open it up. Um, where is the rest of my... Here we go. So I just wanted to bring uh, this next slide up here. And just very briefly, just so people know... Um, because we've been talking about hormones as in hormone replacement, you know, perimenopause and menopause, but just these two slides. So this one from 2012, but we know this. So obese women on Depo-Provera may increase their diabetes risk. So just knowing that even birth control can also start to raise your diabetes risk. And many of you probably have seen, you know, a woman maybe that started on Depo-Provera, she gained 20, 30 pounds. This can happen from these needles. Um, it can be a form of birth control, but some women are particularly susceptible to it. And then I just want to bring this other slide up. So the effects of hormonal contraceptives on glycemic or blood sugar control. So this is from 2014, but I thought it was interesting at the end of the article because it says that, you know, they see a number of side effects are linked to the use of hormonal contraceptives. That's the regular old fashioned birth control, altering blood glucose. But they say at the end, finally, we briefly discuss the ethical responsibility of health professionals to inform about the potential risk of glycemic homeostasis regarding hormonal contraceptive intake. So even then, you know, and many people have been on the birth control pill, maybe on it now, but if you are having issues, we know that you know, Trina and I were just talking about body identical, bioidentical, estradiol, progesterone. When you're on a synthetic birth control pill, it's a synthetic estrogen. It's a synthetic progestin. And those, thing, those um, drugs can have an impact on the body. And the other thing to remember about a birth control pill, it's giving you a fake period. It's not a true period. And it's actually suppressing things going on in your bodies. So just something to be um, aware of when it comes to maybe for younger women or if you have daughters or granddaughters, knowing that those uh, birth control and Depo-Provera can also have an impact on your health. All right, so that was a slide that I had. So maybe we'll open it up to the floor. Does anybody have any questions in the chat? And if you have a question, and I'm also going to, um, here we go. Um, and you can unmute yourself as well, or if anybody wants to, I'll take off the videos. If you want to start your video to ask a question. So does everyone have their hormones figured out? <laughs> Okay, so if you're already on progesterone and estrogen, how would you know if you needed testosterone? Do you wanna go for that one, Trina? Or maybe I'll take that one on. Um, so how do you know if you need testosterone? So the things that I speak with women, so I'm gonna ask about libido. I'm going to ask about your muscle tone. Um, those would be my main, or, or your fat mass, those would be my main questions when I was looking at testosterone. And if those were of concern, then I would add testosterone to the regime as well. 
There is, we can do, people often ask about blood tests and some of you might be wondering that. Um, when it comes to blood tests, you know, what we know is that, especially if you're postmenopausal, we can do a baseline, but we know your levels are all low. And if you look at almost all the guidelines, we base people on their symptoms, not on what the blood testing tells us. Because when they've done studies, and I think Louise Newson just released something recently, and if you don't know her, Newson Health, N-E-W-S-O-N out of the UK. So, you know, she's really tracking a lot of women. And so when she surveyed them, she looked at their estrogen levels in the blood versus the symptoms that they had. And really, we don't see the correlation. Because one hormone is not in itself going to give us, tell us exactly what's going on, because everything is connected. Because we've got estrogen, we've got um, your progesterone, we've got testosterone. But then the other thing we also have is that we have that impact of cortisol. So just because your estrogen may be low, but if you have a high amount of cortisol, then you may be experienced, or maybe your estrogen's high, it looks like you have enough estrogen, but you have a lot of cortisol, then you still may be having a lot of hot flashes or symptoms because of the way cortisol is getting metabolized in your body. And the other thing, if you don't have a, a good or adequate microbiome, so we know that the microbiome, you know, I think most of you know about gut health because that's, you know, we've spoken about that this week, but if your gut health is out of balance, that also will impact your hormones, your estrogen um, and your progesterone. So then that can change the scenario as well. So what is the best solution for extremely dry skin and is this hormone related? We do see a lot of improvement when women go on hormones at the time of menopause. And so it's one, again, that's not talked about as much, but collagen thinning of the skin happens a lot. You know, you see women start, as they go through menopause that um, the skin starts to get dry and gets more wrinkled. Sometimes that's what you see because the collagen is starting to decrease. It always decreases with age, but especially when estrogen and progesterone drop down, we'll start to see more of those changes as well. Um, so definitely, yes. So curious as to what Trina's doing. Um, my numbers are low, but I can't lose the weight unless I cut carbs way back. Am I a good candidate for keto or could be there a hormone issue? 61 years old and no problems with menopause. So I would say that depends. So, you know, Trina and I had a discussion and, you know, I think in this past three years, we've had this virus around called COVID. Okay. And with COVID comes inflammation. And we know there's a lot of research that COVID has huge impacts on our microbiome. COVID has huge impacts on inflammation in our bodies. So um, what Trina and I were speaking about is could inflammation be one of her sources? And we were able you know, to do some of Trina's blood testing and we saw that that has been a role. So that could be a reason why she's holding on to things even though her blood sugars are in that optimal range. So if this is a problem for you, so if your food seem to be good and you're still gaining weight, even despite you're on the blood sugar monitor. So yes, we need to look at your hormones, but prior to that, I would say we need to look at your gut. And if you really wanna look at your gut, you know, if you're in Bermuda, we have a test that can be done, it's called DeNova. It's a test that I send away to America that lets us look at inflammation in the gut. It looks at the distribute, like the, the gut microbiome. If you're in Canada, those tests can be ordered through a naturopath. And um, we have, you know, in Miramichi, we have a few naturopaths. And that can be a really good stepping stone because if you have inflammation, it's going to be hard to lose weight because the body's saying, I'm inflamed, I'm sore, I, I want to hold on to this because something is wrong. So usually the order would be get your gut sorted out first. Then we start to look at hormones. Then, of course, in a lot along the way, we're looking at sleep because sleep can be another issue. If you don't sleep well, then it's gonna cause that inflammation in your body. Um, and then of course, uh, your metabolism. So your muscle mass is another big thing because as your numbers start to change, even though if you can put your freestyle lever and they're fairly smooth, but what is your body doing with it? Because we know that our resting metabolic rate is directly correlated with our muscle mass. It's not correlated with our weight. So you need to have a higher muscle mass. So thinking about things like strength training, um, so that would be a few things to start to address. 
But the hormones, just because you're 61, that's not too old, okay? I put many women that are in their 60s on hormones. Louise Newson, Dr. Newson, I should say, from the UK, she has women in their 80s on hormones. So um, definitely we see the guidelines say within the first 10 years of menopause, no problem. You know, that's the lowest risk. But it doesn't say that we can't prescribe hormones for women over that age. Now, another question. With the compound cream and the compound... Um, hormone therapy would have any effects on the liver. So the compound cream versus the, the sublingual hormone therapy, the effects on the liver. Well, we're kind of working in the situation, depends on how, what your liver is like. So we can have fatty liver disease. If your liver function tests are very elevated, for example. So if I saw a woman and her liver functions were up hot a lot and I were to give her progesterone, so micronized progesterone or prometrium, what might happen in her case is that she might feel more of the sedation side effects. She might feel more sleepy because she's going to metabolize it a little bit slower. Okay. The estrogen, almost always I'm giving estrogen as a topical. I don't use estrogen by mouth because it can slightly raise the risk of stroke. So we're not going to see generally that impact with estrogen. So again, it would depend on what the level of fatty liver disease was, but it's not a contraindication not to give hormones. Like we're seeing fatty liver disease, you know, 2.5 times we're seeing this elevation after menopause. So often it's in combination that we use, of course, dietary lifestyle changes, getting those weights in at the gym, but hormonal therapy, I believe can be an adjuvant to all of that. Oh, sorry, Trina, you're muted. All right, you had it oh, sorted. There you go. <laughs> so any other hormonal based questions for us tonight or or blood sugar? You know, I know it's a lot to take in and and I think it's starting to become more familiar with hormonal management. Um, I'm going to share a link in our group if you haven't heard. So just last month, Oprah Winfrey got together with Maria Shriver and Drew Barrymore little Drew, remember from ET, and uh, they did a series on hormonal management and menopause. And Oprah shares her story and Drew and Maria. And uh, I think it's wonderful that we're getting a lot more exposure and discussion because we're seeing diabetes. You know, diabetes is the fastest growing condition, but the other growing condition is Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And we're still trying to look at, we don't have a study that says yes, you know, it's going to prevent you from having dementia, but there's a few things that we do know that dementia is five times more common in a diabetic and dementia is more common in women. So if we start to look at those associations, what's going on there, that drop in estrogen and progesterone. So could they have a protective role in other parts? Are they going to help to protect this with our, our insulin management? Are they going to help to protect this um, with our bones? Are they going to have to help to protect us with our brain? All right. Well, I think I guess we'll end it on that. I want to thank Trina so much for being here with us tonight. Um, and in the future, I am going to be having in, in the upcoming months, we'll have more of an open discussion about hormone management. And I'll be having a live discussion here in Bermuda about that so we can get all age groups. If you have any other questions for us, again, always feel free just to post them in the Facebook group. Thanks so much, Trina. And thanks everybody for attending tonight. Good night. Take care.